All right, my little pretties, are you ready for chapter six? Wait till Helen comes. Let's see what happens next. That night, Heather had her first bad dream. She woke me up screaming, help, 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 it's on fire, put it out, mommy, put it out. I jumped out of bed, switched on the light and ran to her. She was sitting, sitting up in bed, her eyes squeezed shut, clutching her blanket. Tears ran down her cheeks and she was trembling. Save me, save me, she cried. Heather, I grabbed her shoulders and shook her. You're having a bad dream, wake up. Michael stumbled into the room. What's going on? What's wrong with her? Twisting and turning, Heather squirmed away from me and started running down the hall, still screaming about the fire. Dave caught her and picked her up. It's all right, honey. It's all right, he murmured, rocking her as if she were a baby. Suddenly, she collapsed against him, perfectly relaxed. Her mouth found her thumb. Her long eyelashes fluttered against his cheeks. Her legs dangled like a rag doll. Gently, Dave carried her back into our room and lowered her into bed. There now, he whispered, smoothing her hair back from her forehead. He kissed her. Heather's eyes opened for a second. She smiled at her father before sinking back into sleep. Turning to me, Dave whispered, what happened? She was screaming about the fire. I tried to wake her up, but I couldn't. And then she just jumped out of bed and ran out into the hall. I took mom's hand and slid closer to her. Was, she, was he going to blame me somehow? Dave shook his head and ran his hands through his hair, making it stand up in spikes. She hasn't had those nightmares for so long. I thought she'd gotten over them. Looking at me again, he asked, did, you, did anything upset her today? Well, she was in the graveyard, I said uneasily. She was talking to someone. She thinks there's a girl there, Helen. It sounded ridiculous when I talked about it, and I was embarrassed. I already knew what Michael and mom thought about Ghost. I was sure Dave would have the same reaction. Just as I thought, Dave smiled. Heather's very imaginative, he said. He said it as if I'd criticized her. And very sensitive. You and Michael haven't been asking her questions about the fire, have you? Of course not. I stared at him, shocked. Surely he knew that Michael and I had promised not to talk to Heather about, about the fire. Did he think we would go back on our word? I thought something might have stirred up her memories. He tugged on his beard, gazing at me as if he weren't sure I could be trusted to tell the truth. It's what happened in the graveyard, I said. There's something bad under that oak tree. I know there is. You should make her stay away from it. Even Mr. Simmons told her not to go near it because of snakes and poison ivy. Snakes and poison ivy are one thing, David said slowly. But don't you ever start scaring her with stories about bad things in the graveyard. Molly thinks the graveyard is haunted, my loyal brother said. She's sure some ghost is after Heather. Mom and dad both turned on me then. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, Molly, Mom said, and Dave agreed. No more talk about ghosts, he said, especially not around Heather. I don't want you scaring her. No wonder she had a nightmare. But I didn't tell her. She told me. I pulled away from Mom, feeling betrayed, first by Michael and then by her. And besides, you didn't see her. You didn't hear her. Michael laughed. Molly didn't scare Heather, he said. Heather scared Molly. Dave sighed and put his arm around mom's shoulder. Well, no sense standing all here all night arguing about it, he said. Just don't inflict your own fears on Heather, Molly. You've been fretting about the graveyard ever since we moved in here. It doesn't bother anybody else, so forget it, okay? He reached out and gave my head a pat. As I started to go back into my room, he added, I see Heather's visits to the graveyard as a way of coming to terms with her mother's death. It's probably good for her, as long as nobody scares her. 
He looked at me again, leaving no doubt about whom he meant. Closing my door, I tiptoed back to bed. Before I lay down, I peeked at Heather. The moonlight shone on her face, and I was sure her eyes were open a tiny slit. I bet you lay there and listened to every word we said, I whispered, but she didn't answer. Turning my back to her and the window, I switched on my tape player and fell asleep listening to West Side Story. The next morning, after Dave had disappeared into the carriage house, Mom into her loft, and Michael into the woods, I sat at the breakfast table with Heather, watching her poke at her cereal in her bowl. What are you going to do today? I asked her. Nothing. She carried her bowl to the garbage can and dumped most of her cereal. I bet you're going to the graveyard again. She looked at me over her shoulder, tangles of hair almost hiding her face. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. It's none of your business, is it? There isn't really a ghost, is there? You are making it up. You heard what Daddy said last night. No more talk about ghosts or trying to scare me. I'm going to tell him you're still doing it. With her hand on the screen door, she added, you better not follow me or spy on me either. You'll be sorry if you do. Helen doesn't like people who bother me. Before I could say anything, she was gone, leaving the screen door to bang shut behind her. Running to the window over the sink, I watched her saunter across the yard and disappear through the graveyard gate. Just once, she looked back and scowled at me. Since it was my day to wash the breakfast dishes, I filled the sink with hot, soapy water and watched the oh, and watched the bowls and mugs and the glasses slowly fill and sink beneath the bubbles. While I washed them, I wondered what I should do about Heather and the ghost, if there was a ghost. In the morning sunlight, it seemed almost likely that I had imagined the presence of something inhuman under the oak tree. Maybe mom was right about the poetry I'd been reading, especially the Poe. After I finished the dishes, I made my bed, trying to ignore the tangle of sheets, blanket, and clothes on Heather's bed. Then I picked up Watership Down and went outside to read. Stretching out in the shade of one of the maples, I opened my book, but the warmth of the summer made it hard Sorry. Uh, searching out in the shade of one of the maples, I opened my book, but the warmth of summer made it hard to concentrate. In the droning of bees, in the rustling of leaves, in the swaying of wildflowers, I imagined I heard Helen's voice whispering to Heather, calling her, promising her things. Closing my book, I left it under the tree and I crossed the lawn to the graveyard. I crept along the outside of the hedge. Paused when I reached the oak tree and peered through the leaves at the little stone, expecting to see Heather sitting there. All I saw was the peanut butter jar filled with fresh flowers. Pushing through the hedge, I forced myself to approach the tombstone. H-E-H, -H, I read. March 7th, 1879 to August 8th, 1886. She'd been dead for a hundred years, so much longer than she'd been alive. And what was left of her now? A tangle of bones? Maybe nothing but dust? I shivered, cold in the shade of the oak, hugging myself to get warm. Thinking about the snakes, I backed away from the grave, feeling the warm sunlight strike my back as I moved out of the shade of the oak. With bees droning in the Queen's Anne's lace and a butterfly flitting around my head, it was strange to think of death, especially the death of a little girl, younger even than I was. Could she really still be here, haunting this grave? If she did exist, what did she want? A breeze sighed through the leaves of the oak. It was the loneliest sound I'd ever heard, as lonely as a ghost who'd been lying alone in the dark for a hundred years. Overwhelmed with a terrible feeling of sadness and despair, I turned and ran out of the graveyard, feeling my heart pound. I wanted to go to mom, but I knew she would laugh at me, or worse, get cross. Knowing it was useless to turn to Dave, I decided to look for Michael. I guessed he was somewhere in the woods and just followed the path along the creek, hoping I might find him trying to catch crawfish where the water slowed near the fence. 
At the end of the path, at the end of the path, though, all I saw were the cows standing knee deep in the creek and staring stupidly at me. As I looked around, wondering where Michael might have gone, I noticed a path on the other side of the creek angling off into the trees. It looked like the sort of thing Michael would enjoy exploring, so I pulled off my sandals, waded across, and followed the path into the woods. After walking for about 10 minutes, I found myself besides the creek again. Ahead of me, the woods thinned out, and I saw a large pond. Hurrying towards it, I looked around for Michael. Sure, he'd been here, but there was no sign of him. On the rising ground above the pond were the ruins of an old stone house. Although the house was two stories high on the side facing the water, the rest of the house was crumbling heap of rock and charred wood. Long ago, it must have burned, I thought. But before that, it must have been beautiful, standing there on the hill, looking out across the valley to the mountains. While I was gazing at the house, trying to imagine it whole, I saw a flash of color, the red of a t-shirt instantly visible. Thinking it was Michael, I started to call to him. Then I stopped myself. Heather had been wearing a red t-shirt when she ran out of the kitchen this morning. What was she doing here, so far away from home? Running across the clearing between the house and the pond, I crept through the underbrush surrounding the ruins, trying hard to make no noise. As I reached the corner of the house, I heard Heather's voice and dropped silently to my knees, crawling through a thicket of pokeberries and honeysuckle. I spotted Heather sitting on what once must have been a terrace. Oh, it's lovely here, Helen, she said, turning toward a space in the air, a sort of shimmering emptiness that reminded me of heat waves thrown by a campfire on a hot day. I was sure that Heather could see someone or something that she could hear a voice speaking in the breeze. Shivering, I felt the hairs on my neck and arms rise. At any moment, I expected to see what Heather saw, and I was sure that Michael would not laugh if he were here. Even Mom would, ha Mom and Dave would have to believe me. Heather was not sitting on that stone bench alone talking to imaginary friend. Something was with her, and I was sure it was no friend. Very slowly and cautiously, I backed away into my tunnel through the underbrush. All of a sudden, the house seemed threatening, more frightening than the graveyard itself. Its ruined walls towered over me, smoke scorched and smelling, smelling still of charred wood and ash. Something terrible had happened here. I knew it had, and I wanted to get away, to save myself from whatever waited here in those ruins. Breaking free of the bushes and the trees, I ran toward the pond, not caring now whether Heather saw me or not. Once I reached the safety of the woods, I slowed down, finally collapsed on a fallen tree, gasping for breath. While I sat there, trying to breathe normally, I heard someone coming down the path. Looking up, I saw Heather walking towards me. At the sight of me, she stopped, obviously startled. What are you doing here? Her hands balled into fists. She stood in the middle of the path, sunlight and shadow modeling her face and clothes with random patches of darkness and light. You followed me again! Standing up to give myself advantage of height, I shook my head. I was looking for Michael, I said, and I saw you on the terrace talking to someone. Heather tilted her head to one side, her jaw protruding at a stubborn angle. So? Heather, this isn't a good place. Frightened, I reached out to take her arm, but she sidestepped me. Don't try and tell me what to do, Molly! Heather's gray eyes stared into mine. This is Helen's house. She invited me here, and I'll come whenever I want to. You're the one who better stay away. Listen to me, Heather. Please, Helen isn't your friend. She, she, I don't know what she is, but she's dangerous. Stay away from her. I seized the little girl's arm and I shook her. Don't come here anymore. As quickly as a cat, Heather wriggled away from me. Since when did you ever care what I do? Helen's a better friend than you've been. She understands me. She likes me. Heather's thin chest rose and rapidly. 
Heather's thin chest rose and fell rapidly as she backed off, her eyes huge and frightened in her pale face. Don't you, don't you dare try to take her away from me. A shift in the breeze lifted the leaves over our head and a ray of sunlight struck Heather, glinting on a silver locket I'd never seen before. Aware of my eyes, Heather closed a small hand over the locket. What's that? I moved toward her, but she turned and ran away from me back toward the church. She gave it to me, Heather cried over her shoulder. It's mine and you can't see it. I stood still for a moment and watched her vanish around a curve in the path, her thin white legs flashing through the weeds. Fearfully, I glanced back at the ruins of the house on the hill. For a moment, I thought I saw a face at one of the windows, but I wasn't sure. The honeysuckle and ivy draping, a shift in the breeze lifted the leaves over our head. Oh, whoops. The honeysuckle and ivy draping the walls were fluttering in the breeze, and what I saw could have been a shadow or a patch of sunlight. Without looking at the house again, I ran down the path after Heather. And that is the end of, wait till Helen comes, chapter six.